Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the location of the Ark of the Covenant. That's right, we found it in the scripture. And we're going to share its exact location with you and even give the prophecy on when we'll actually get to see it again. Now, I have to give credit to one of our subscribers, Ancient Paths, as he brought out 2 Maccabees in chapter 2, which talks about the Ark. This is Hanukkah season, and a lot of people are reviewing the Maccabees books, which is where we get the information from about Hanukkah. And I guess in doing so, he ran across this part here in 2 Maccabees chapter 2 about the Ark. So let's just look down here and compare it to what we've found over in the Pseudepigrapha and the lives of the prophets. Okay, so we're looking here at verse four. It says, and it was contained in the same writing, how the prophet being warned by God commanded that the tabernacle and the ark should accompany him till he came forth to the mountain where Moses went up and saw the inheritance of God. And now I see how it is that I overlooked this part about the ark in my reading many years ago. The previous verses talks about not forsaking the law or being distracted by idols of gold and silver. That kind of reminds us when we started hearing about Hanukkah after Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a pig on the altar. But anyway, down here in verse four, it's talking about the tabernacle and the ark and how Jeremiah was given a commandment on what to do with it. Like we see in verse five, it says, and when Jeremiah came thither, he found a hollow cave and he carried in thither the tabernacle and the ark and the altar of incense and so stopped it up. So here it is. Jeremiah has the ark, the tabernacle and the incense altar. And he stuck them into a cave and shut the door behind them. Verse six says, then some of them that followed him came up to mark the place, but they could not find it, I guess, because they wanted to know where he had hidden the ark so they could go get it. But then verse seven says, and when Jeremiah perceived it, he blamed them, saying, the place shall be unknown till God gather together the congregation of the people and receive them to mercy. So Jeremiah is telling them that they're not going to be able to find that place. But this is in second Maccabees chapter two. But notice back up there in verse four that it says it was also contained in the same writing. And I believe this same writing that they're referring to can be found in the Old Testament pseudepigraph of volume two. Now notice the link to this volume of books here. It took me a while to find the book that I'm gonna show you today. So you might wanna take note. You can actually download this entire book, the pseudepigrapha volume two with this link and simply changing the two to a one. We can read and or download volume one of the pseudepigrapha. If you're interested in these books, I hope you guys are downloading them. You may know that the last time I gave you a link to a free copy of the keys of Enoch and we got a chance to download that book for free. The link all of a sudden went dead and we weren't able to get that PDF even today. So we need to get it while we can, but they can't hide this information from us for forever. We're going to get it one way or the other. So let's go on. We're looking down here in the lives of the prophets where we can read about all of the prophets like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, Amos, and so forth. But the one we're interested in is Jeremiah, who was born in Anathos and died in Tephne of Egypt, having been stoned by his people and this is the way all of these stories go. It kind of tells where they was from, how they were killed, what significant things they did and so on. Like for instance, how Jeremiah helped the Egyptians with crocodiles, with snake fighters and some real interesting stories here. But we're gonna drop down here to verse eight where it really starts getting interesting. When it says Jeremiah gave a sign to the priest of Egypt that it was decreed that their idols would be shaken and collapsed 
through a savior, a child born of a virgin in a manger. This, of course, is talking about our Messiah. And it's also referring it to what we see over in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, which talks about the feet of our Messiah landing on Mount Olives and breaking it in half, essentially turning that mountain into a crater. That is that stone that we hear about in the book of Daniel that is supposed to destroy all of the world economies. But notice back over here in Jeremiah says, Wherefore, even to this day, they revere a virgin giving birth and placing an infant in a manger they worship. And notice how this is talking about that manger scene we see pop up every year around Christmas time. It looks like it started in Egypt. That was the Egyptians way of remembering this prophecy that was given by Jeremiah. I guess that's why in 2 Maccabees, it was talking about idols and gold and silver ornaments and stuff. That also sounds like Christmas. And again, Hanukkah is related to Christmas as well. So all of these are tying together. But it says, and when Ptolemy the king inquired about the cause, they said, it is an ancestral ministry delivered to our fathers by a holy prophet. And we are to await, he says, the consummation of this mystery which we're still waiting for today. But again, that's the reason for their manger scene that they erect every year around Christmas time. It gets real interesting when you consider the Haggai chapter two prophecies that talks about the great earthquake and how it prophesies it to start the day before the 25th day of the ninth month, which around the year 2024 would fall around Christmas Eve, when once again, Hanukkah and Christmas converge around the same day. But anyway, it says the prophet before the capture of the temple sees the Ark of the law and the things in it and made them to be swallowed up in a rock. So here we are getting to the story of what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, just like we read over in Second Maccabees. Jeremiah was responsible for hiding it. It says here he made it to be swallowed up in a rock, which is what we read over in 2 Maccabees, where he put it in a cave and shut up the door. The lives of the prophets goes on to say, and to those standing by, he said, the Lord has gone away from Zion into heaven and will come again in power. So this is referring to the Shekinah glory and how it comes down to earth periodically. Well, here after he shut up the ark would have been a time around when the Shekinah glory was leaving the planet. It says, and this will be for you a sign of his coming when all the Gentiles worship a piece of wood. And this reminds me of a comment I saw yesterday from a new subscriber, JY, who was talking about the cross. And I didn't pay much attention to it then. But could that be what Jeremiah was talking about when he said that they will be worshiping a piece of wood? Hmm. Y'all let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I'm going to go on. It says, and he said, the ark, no one is going to bring out except Aaron and none of the priests or prophets will any longer open the tablets in it except Moses, God's chosen one. Now, this is getting real interesting here especially in light of Revelation chapter 8, where we read about the angel of the covenant, which I understand is Aaron. Aaron was transformed into the angel of the covenant and would be the same one talked about in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, which says, And another angel came forth and stood at the altar, having the golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So here is the covenant angel, like I said, Aaron, who's standing before the incense altar, which like we read in verse four, which says, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. 
So notice how all of this is tying together. You have this incense altar, you have this earthquake, you have the covenant angel, all before the seven angels start to blow their trumpets that we read about in Revelation chapter 8. It says here that Aaron is the only one to bring out the ark. And it goes on to say, and in the resurrection, the ark will be the first to be resurrected and will come out of the rock and be placed on Mount Sinai. And all the saints will be gathered to it there as they await the Lord and flee from the enemy who wishes to destroy them. So here is saying that, that the ark will be resurrected and will be placed on Mount Sinai. But notice back over here in Second Maccabees where it's at now. Verse 4 says that it's in the mountain where Moses went up and saw the inheritance. That's actually Mount Nebo. So we're over here looking at a map. We see that Mount Nebo is on the west side of Jericho. And Mount Olives is where the rock is supposed to land. So think about that for a second. If the ark is in Mount Nebo and a rock lands on Mount Olives, how big is that rock going to be? That's going to splash the Ark of the Covenant all the way down here to Mount Sinai. Hmm. It's going to be a big rock. I guess that's why it destroys all of the economies in the world. But notice here how it says all of the saints will be gathered to it as they await the Lord and flee from the enemy who wishes to destroy them. But we understand that that part of the world will be destroyed and anybody close to Jerusalem will be destroyed with it. So this reminds me of that picture we always see when they're talking about the 144,000, how they all seem to be gathered around one site. Well, from all of the scripture that I've read, the way this seems to be going to play out is we're going to have the rock that lands in Jerusalem that causes the global earthquake that wakes up the saints and makes them realize what time it is. And their gathering is not in the physical because that part of the world will be destroyed. But wherever they're at, all around the rest of the world will focus in on what has just happened, realizing that it's the great earthquake that we hear about in Revelation chapter 8 understanding that what comes next is the persecution on those who obey the commandments. So don't think that everybody is supposed to run to Jerusalem. Those Zionists that are leading people to Jerusalem are leading them there for their destruction. We have to read our scripture and understand that America is the promised land. The land of milk and honey, that's talking about cattle and bees, not gold and silver. But anyway, it says in the rock with his finger, he set as a seal the name of God. And the impression was like a carving made of iron and a cloud covered the name. And no one knows the place nor is able to read the name to this day and to the consummation. So the Ark of the Covenant is over in these mountains over here hidden and nobody can actually find it because it's in a cave with a big rock covering it. It says, and the rock is in the wilderness where the ark was at first, between the two mountains on which Moses and Aaron lie. So it is second Maccabees that tells us that it's on Mount Nebo, but they're getting their information from this book, the lives of the prophet Jeremiah, which is saying that it's actually between the two mountains where Moses and Aaron lie. So while there may be a lot of people looking at Mount Nebo for it, according to what we read there, it could be anywhere between Mount Nebo and Mount Hor, which is a three hour drive by car. So no wonder nobody could find it. It says, and at night there is a cloud like fire, just like the ancient one, for the glory of God will never cease from his law. So there is a hint. If they really wanted to find it, they would have to be looking for this cloud. But this cloud is actually associated with the law. So maybe there's only certain people that would be able to find where it's located. I don't know. If you ever go over there and take a look, let me know what you find. 
It says, And God bestowed his favor upon Jeremiah, that he might himself perform the completion of his mystery, so that he might become a partner of Moses, and they are together to this day. Now, is that why they mistaked our Messiah for Jeremiah? Hmm. There's a lot going on in these books of the lives of the prophets. But one thing for sure, it tells us the location of the Ark of the Covenant, how to find it, and when it's going to return to us and where it would be. I guess when you look at the big picture, that's not a big place to start looking. But the closer you get, you see the harder it's going to be to find it. So at least we know and knowing is half the battle. Let me know what y'all think in the comment section and I'll see you down there.